Okay, today we're going to be adding some more organisms to the oceans. In fact, uh, the most numerous uh, type of organism that we see in the biosphere. Um, before we do that, though, let's uh, kind of review uh, very, very briefly um, what happens to phytoplankton prior production. We, th we talked about many fates of, um, of phytoplankton. Uh, they can be lysed by viruses. We'll say a few more words about viruses today. They can sink out of the water column. But a very important fate of, of these organisms is to be eaten uh, by a large range of organisms, uh, ranging, ranging from mesozooplankton, actually even bigger than that, uh, micro, uh, macrozooplankton. And at the other end of the spectrum are the proteas, the uh, single cell eukaryotes, uh, such as these flagellates that are indicated here. And today we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about another fate of, of prior production, that is the the, uh, the uh, release of non-living organic material, detritus, and dissolved organic material, DOM, and what happens to that. And it turns out to be a big fate of prime production is via that route, the microbial loop, which you'll know about now, uh, learn about now. Um, I, I know that some of you probably had some of this material in the previous class, uh, but uh, you'll, I hope, learn a lot more today. So let's, uh, before we get into talking about microbes in microbial loop, uh, I'd like to uh, summarize uh, the zooplankton one final time and introduce a, a new class of organisms, a bit bigger class, uh, the macro zoo, uh, zooplankton. And you can see the size range here for the macros are a bit bigger. Well, they're, they're the next size up for the mesozooplankton, which we've been talking about already. And here um, I explicitly put the krill, that is, you found it's in the macrozooplankton. But remember, there's some, um, these are a bit fluid for depending on the species. Um, for example, the, the adult stages of, of, of copepods would be mesozooplankton because of their size, but the nopulae and perhaps even the copepidite stages uh, would be in the microzooplankton size. So, uh, so these are just examples and, and uh, of, of some of these organisms in their size range, but they can move depending on their on their life stage. Uh, I, I haven't talked and, and mentioned and used this word nanozooplankton because it's just not used. And the reason why is because of mixotrophy. It's just uh, a lot of these organisms are simply not zooplankton. It'd be um, inaccurate or, or not accurate to call them zooplankton at all. Um, and so the more, much more common um, words to describe these organisms are proteas or perhaps nanoflagellates, um, emphasizing their, their small size. And we could go even for, uh, 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 one more size down would be the picoplankton, uh, but there's only a few organisms that are capable of grazing in that size range. So that's why I don't have it on the, on the table here. Um, more important than, than their names is what they're doing. Um, and again, I hope this is a review. Um, the uh, macrozooplankton and mesozooplankton perhaps are involved in, in eating some phytoplankton, but the real um, uh, grazers of the phytoplankton are, are smaller than that, the, the micro and nanoplankton, um, or the, the, the flagellates. Um, at the other stream, the, uh, the macro and mesozooplankton are definitely eating other zooplankton. Um, that makes them carnivores, whereas perhaps some of the microzooplankton are, eat, are eating some of the flagellates, that is, they're carnivores. Uh, but even then, they may be eating a mixotroph, uh, which you know kind of makes them a kind of a mixture of both a carnivore and an herbivore. And there is really isn't much. Uh, a few organisms are smaller than that that are capable of grazing. So there's very little carnivory um, in the uh, among the flagellates. Um, talking about even smaller prey, the bacteria. Um, so the, these large zooplankton simply are not are just too big to eat the bacteria for the most part. Whereas that's really important uh, food source for the uh, flagellates. Mixotrophy mentioned this already. Basically, you don't see that for the large organisms, um, whereas it's really quite common for the flagellates in the uh, two to twenty micron size range, and, and also for uh, those few organisms that are a little bit less uh, smaller than that that may be capable of grazing and carrying out photosynthesis. So um, there's also an inverse relationship between carbon export and size. Um, so, so the largest organisms are definitely uh, very much uh, a big factor in um, moving carbon from the top of the ocean to the bottom. Whereas these smaller organisms, generally are, um, as a first approximation, you can think that they're too, just too small to sink out. And the only exception to that is some work showing that they form these aggregates 
that are big enough to sink out of the water column. But as a first approximation, again, if you're small, you're not going to sink. And then likewise, um, the bigger you are, the more likely you're, you're going to be eaten by a fish or a fish larvae, um, which we talked a little about um, on Thursday, uh, whereas that's not the case for these smallest organisms. So that's the zooplankton community. And now we're going to talk about a, another fate of prime production, um, that is the, the microbial loop. But before we get to that, let's just review and, and just emphasize how the microbial loop differs from the traditional food chain, which consists of basically one organism eating another. And of course, we know that these organisms are excreting um, inorganic nutrients that are taken up by phytoplankton, but for the most part, it's a, a, a one organism eating another. Um, and so the question um, um, I have then is what happens to the, the, the uh, excretion? The, the, the organic material that's released by all these organs, the poop. And so here's one example uh, of a, of a of the excretion byproduct um, that is a fecal pellet produced by a copepod that we saw um, in the subarctic Pacific. It's stained for uh, with a lectin, uh, that's a protein that binds to polysaccharides um, that's specific for chitin. It turns out chitin um, is a uh, polymer of, of N-acetylglucosamine often said to be second only in, in abundance to cellulose in the biosphere. And perhaps it's arguably it's even more abundant than cellulose um, in the oceans. Uh, copepods and other crustaceans are made up of, of, of chitin. Their exoskeleton is chitin. Um, if you ever have a soft shell crab, you're eating um, a, a easily digested form of crab when you crunch into that uh, soft shell. Um, and, and, their, and their fecal pellet is also um, cased in chitin. Um, and that helps it, I, I imagine, to get out of the, uh, the uh, GI tract of the zooplankton. Anyway, so that this is one just one example of a detrital particle uh, that's produced by a zooplankton in the oceans. So, um, so all that all that uh, detritus, that non-living organic material, um, is thought to uh, traditionally was thought to be the that was the role of bacteria. That's why we had bacteria in the ocean. It was to get rid of that material and turn it back into intergag compounds um, that could be used by the phytoplankton. Um, and most um, importantly, these bacteria would excrete ammonium and phosphate that would be used by the uh, phytoplankton. Now that's certainly the case, but we'll see in a moment that there's a complication and, and these bacteria do other things. So the traditional role is to release nutrients. Now, if we want to be a bit more quantitative about this, we can uh, build on the this basic equation of life that, that we talked about before, showing photosynthesis. And the, the um, well, actually, photosynthesis is going the other way, I should say. This is showing heterotrophy, showing the oxidation of organic material here uh, but with oxygen and producing carbon dioxide and water. But of course, that organic material has nutrients in it, nitrogen and phosphorus. And using the Redfield ratio, we can make this equation a bit more complicated by adding um, nitrogen and phosphorus and in ratios that were uh, measured by Redfield and have been looked at quite extensively ever since um, his work. And we see that um, this is, would be the quantitative pr uh, production of, of nitrogen and phosphorus. Now this, this equation, um, so first of all, I don't want you to, you, you should know this equation. Um, you don't necessarily need to know that equation. You should know that, of course, that, that organic material has nitrogen and phosphorus and that when it's, oxid, uh, when it's broken down, decomposed by, by all heterotrophs, um, it can release uh, not only carbon dioxide, but, and this is, this is incorrect, it should be really ammonium here. Um, it, there's, there's another couple steps that are needed to produce um, nitrate from ammonium. Um, so, but the important point is that both inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus are released during degradation. Um, I hope you knew that already. And of course, that's important for uh, refueling uh, the uh, uh, phytoplankton uh, and their growth. So, um, so now let's think about uh, uh, some changes to that traditional carbon flow, where basically one organism is eating another. And, and one of the uh, 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 realizations that we needed to change it was that there's a lot of material that was dissolved, uh, dissolved organic material. And, and that uh, uh, discovery prompted some changes in this uh, view of how carbon flowed through the system. Um, so what is DOM? Well, basically, it's, it's the operational definition. It, it go, it's defined as whatever goes to this glass fiber filter 
which has a, a pore size of about 0.6 or so in microns in diameter, and the pore size is about 0.6 in diameter, although uh, it um, really catches things often much smaller than that. Um, this, the compounds are largely unknown. That's a, a, a big uh, effort is being spent by the marine um, organic geochemists who are trying to identify these compounds. Um, it's a huge part of the carbon cycle, so that's one reason why uh, there's so much interest in trying to figure out what it is. Some of it's 10,000 years old, uh, uh, very, very old stuff. Other, other compounds like amino acids and sugars um, are used quite rapidly by bacteria and may only last minutes uh, in the water column. Um, and so what, what's basically done very, very briefly is that that material that goes through the filter is burnt up uh, with... Uh, uh, perhaps or, or not with uh, help of a catalyst and that the CO2 from that uh, burnt up organic material is measured and that operationally is what's defined as dissolved organic carbon. So it's a huge um, uh, uh, component of the carbon cycle. There's more um, organic carbon in uh, DOC and DOM than there is in living organisms. Much more uh, carbon in living in, in DOC and detritus uh, than living organisms. Um, and that material is taken up by heterotrophic bacteria. Um, and they are the best ones at taking it up because of, of, uh, of they're their small. Um, they're roughly uh, right around here or so in size, roughly a half a micron in size in the oceans. And so they're bigger than even the cyanobacteria um, uh, that are one micron or bigger uh, than the heterotrophic bacteria. And they're certainly a lot bigger than the proteus uh, which can be, you know, as much as 10 microns or bigger uh, in size and diameter. So the heterotrophic bacteria are, are best at taking up this DOM because, again, they have high surface area to volume ratio. It's the same argument that we used before to, to argue for why small phytoplankton dominate in the uh, ligotrophic open ocean is because they're, um, are, they have a high surface area to volume ratio and are thus really competitive for dissolved nutrients. So, uh, so what happens to that carbon that's, that's released by various processes, defecation, excretion, molting, and just plain old death of these organisms? So there's particular organic material that's produced, such as this copepod decopellant, but of course many other forms of particular organic material, that is it's, it's particles and bigger than 0.6 microns. And, and so that's eaten by bacteria. That's one, one uh, traditional role for these bacteria. But I want to emphasize that Zooplankton are also capable of eating this detritus, and we'll talk uh, quite a bit more about the uh, detritivores, um, organisms in the benthos and in um, uh, salt marshes and in estuaries that um, eat detritus, this non-living organic material. And that's a really important part of their food source often, is this non-living organic material. Um, uh, but um, we're, uh, we, we've been focusing also on the dissolvent material, the dissolved organic material, of which one component uh, is DOC, dissolved organic carbon. So that's taken up uh, pretty much exclusively by bacteria, by heterotrophic bacteria. Um, so if we think about what's happening with this organic material, you know one answer to that already. It's the release of these of, of carbon dioxide. Again, it's not nitrate, but ammonium. Um, and then... Uh, phosphate um, as well. But they're not doing it just to, to, um, to uh, make more nutrients for phytoplankton. They're, they're not just doing it for, for being good guys and keeping the phytoplankton alive and healthy. They're doing it because they want to make more cells. And so that's the reason why these bacteria are doing it, is to, is to grow and to, and to produce, reproduce and to have uh, larger numbers of their offspring. So that's the change uh, in, in, in our way of thinking about the carbon flow in the oceans and actually all um, natural ecosystems. Uh, this work has started with the oceans. Uh, uh, there's analogous work done in lakes and other fresh waters. Um, and to so, some extent, it's being done also in soils where a lot of the carbon um, is also detritus in, in, in dissolved form. And it's used by microbes and bacteria. Um, the difference is, is that in soils, fungi are really important, whereas fungi are not important in the oceans. So, so, um, so the, the production of this biomass of these cells by bacteria, um, that becomes food for other organisms. Um, and that supports a whole other um, 
uh, uh, a way of thinking about the flow of energy um, in carbon through the system. So, so the, the, the term loop was devised by uh, Fruk Asim now about 30 years ago. Um, and, and basically the idea is that you get this production of dissolved organic material from all the other all the organisms in, this, in the system <clears throat> um, from what we could call the traditional food chain, the grazer food chain, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and that DOM could, is only used basically for by bacteria, which are grazed on by a, a whole suite, complicated suite of organisms. Um, they're, they, they're all small for the most part, and they're, uh, they're all proteas. And those proteas in turn are grazed on by uh, larger grazers. So they're being looped back, that carbon is being looped back into the system. And so if we didn't have bacteria for whatever reason, we wouldn't have um, this happening. Um, and all that carbon would be just kind of going to a, a dead end and would not be looped back to the uh, 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 system. We'd be lost. So um, so here's just another view of that. Um, here I have phytoplankton production being grazed, the big guys being grazed on by big grazers. It, it would be, a, for the most part, micro-grazers, microzooplankton, perhaps a few mesozooplankton, very, very rarely the macrozooplankton. Um, these small grazers, uh, you should know, are the flagellates, perhaps some microzooplankton. And uh, the bacteria are grazing, and not grazing, that's not the term we would use. They, they're taking up the dissolved organic material. And in turn, they're uh, feeding the, uh, the produce in the small flagellates. And that's in turn feeding the rest of the food chain. So the question is, how much goes this route? How much goes this way um, through the bacteria, through the DOM pool and through bacteria? So there's been a lot of work on this question. And I'm gonna, I, I just like to show you one um, set of experiments to indicate um, that it's actually a very, very high fraction of prior production is routed through the microbial loop. And the experiment basically is to look at respiration in various size fractions. So if you measure what's happening with oxygen here, and this is basically measuring oxygen consumption in different size fractions. So you basically to back up, you filter the water through nets of various sizes ranging from 200 down all the way to 0.8. Um, and then you measure respiration and also you measure photosynthesis. So this work was um, you know, done by Peter J. Levy Williams, who's now retired. He was in, he's an English guy, um, now lives in Bangor, uh, Wales, in the UK. Um, a, real, a real character of a guy. He's, uh, I know him pretty well. Anyway, um, so he, uh, he, 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 he did this review now 15 years ago, but still um, uh, applicable and true today. Um, and measured, uh, took all the data that were available at the time on photosynthesis and respiration. And he normalized it to, you know, so that every, all these studies were, um, were, could be compared. And even though the absolute rate would vary, um, he uh, called the total rate one and then looked at the rate of prior production uh, photosynthesis um, in the less than 200 micron size fraction and respiration. So you can see that there are some large phytoplankton um, in this uh, sample because, or, or all these samples, because there's, you know, not 100% of prior production is in the, uh, in the le less than 200 micron size fraction, but nearly all the uh, respiration. So that, that shows, right here alone, shows the importance of all these organisms that are smaller than 200 microns. So we're talking basically um, the, the microplankton, the, the uh, flagellates, and also the bacteria. Filter through a 53 micron mesh, now you get a little bit less uh, photosynthesis. So that's saying that these large diatoms and, and everything, um, uh, you know, they're contributing a little bit more. But prior, uh, photosynthesis hasn't really decreased at all. So on. You keep on going down. And so now if we go down to two microns, you can see here basically all the uh, photosynthesis is basically removed by this two micron um, filter. Now that's saying to me that basically Peter was using. Um, studies that were done from coastal waters where the, the uh, pico phytoplankton are not really abundant and not really important. Remember how we said that they're really important in the open oceans. So this would be a little bit different if we were to do this experiment with open ocean samples. But you can see that, that, that there's, although there's not much photosynthesis in this size fraction, there's still a lot of respiration. And then when you go down to 0.8 microns um, and look at the organisms in that size range, basically, roughly, you know, 
there, what's only the only thing left is bacteria at this point. And we see there's no photosynthesis, so that means there's really no prochlorococcus. Again, this is coastal waters probably. Um, but there's a lot of respiration. In fact, there's roughly half of the respiration. Um, uh, is, well, not quite half, but, but still a large fraction of the respiration is by the less than 0.8 micron size fraction. So that was those type of experiments were among the first to demonstrate how much uh, respiration is done by bacteria. And so it's, you know, you know, I kind of rounded up here. Other studies indicate it's roughly half. So that's the number I'd like you to remember. Um, even though I'm kind of cheating a little bit here, it's not quite half, but certainly the air bars include half and, and then some. So, so that this type of experiment indicated that about half of all prior production is routed through the microbial loop. It's going this way. In fact, it's going all the way up there. And, and, and uh, we won't get into the data, but there's relatively little carbon that's being passed on to um, um, higher trophic levels by bacteria. But what it's saying is just the importance of this pathway for the, uh, for the phytoplankton prior production. Okay, so let's look into more detail about how we look at these organisms. Um, as you may, may imagine, um, there's lots of really fancy technology now being used to look at bacteria. Um, uh, one is, is a flow cytometer, which we've encountered before for looking at the small phytoplankton. Um, if we stain the cells with uh, DNA uh, specific stains, uh, we can also look at them by flow cytometry. And this is the uh, picture of the, uh, uh, of the type of flow cytometry, flow cytometer that we have down here in Lewis. It's the fax caliber. It's one of the most, it's a workhorse um, and it's still very commonly used, even though it's a really old uh, machine. In fact, you can see, kind of guess at the age of this by looking at the computer here, really kind of probably an old monitor and I can see it's an old Mac um, that's running this, but it's still, that's, that's how it's still done today. Um, you know, don't change it if it's, if it's working. There, I have to say there are really fancy flow cytometers. Some that are extremely small, uh, that are very, very useful, but this, this particular brand is, is very common. And we talked already about how it's, how it's done. The other way which we very commonly count, um, microbes in general, but bacteria spe uh, specifically is what's called the epifluorescence microscope. And, uh, I don't, I don't want to get into the details of how this works, but uh, very, very briefly, um, a light is shined down onto the sample. That's the epi part of it. And then the fluorescence from the sample comes back up through the ocular and you see it either uh, if you're looking through the scope actually, or you see it on the computer screen, which is how we do it in my lab. So that's how we count these organisms. Um, well, you can imagine back um, in history, uh, we didn't have those type of uh, fancy microscopes. And um, uh, to back up, so so electron microscopy, yes, it, it is used, um, but it's not. It's much more difficult to use it, um, and we get other types of information. It's not really the the workhorse, I would say, for looking at um, microbes in the ocean, bacteria, and other uh, small organisms. Um, but back in the day, back in the, in the 1700s um, and 1600s, um, of course, they didn't have all those fancy techniques. And, and the whole field basically started off with this Dutch guy, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who developed this microscope. This is the microscope he used right there. And um, he was basically, uh, uh, you know, back then, uh, so there, you know, scientists didn't do this for a living. They were, they were doing other jobs. And, um, and, he, and he just had this, um, he was very good at, at grinding glass. And, and for the longest time, actually, his discoveries weren't appreciated by others because he was not very sharing of his technology for making these microscopes. But he, anyway, he, he, he made this very primitive microscope and put this, you know, this is basically only a few inches in, in size and put the sample, I believe, right there. And you can see that he basically took it, whatever he could get his hands on. And my favorite is that he um, he took a, a sample of his teeth, and I think back then they, their dental hygiene wasn't the greatest. And I'm sure there was all, all sorts of amaculis that were existing on his teeth and um, and uh, elsewhere on his body. I think he, he basically took everything he could find, and we won't go into details of all the other things he took from his body to look at, but suffice to say, he looked at it all. So that was the start of it, and ever since then, we've been looking at these organisms and, and trying to figure out what they, they are. So who are these organisms? Well, um, 
you, I hope you know this already, but this is a brief, brief review that bacteria have their own kingdom of organisms, or domain rather. Um, and we've talked about these organisms. And, and for the most part, uh, this is a really old diagram. There's um, each of these are, are phylum level, and there's uh, many, as many as 50, perhaps 100, and depending on how you define it, perhaps even hundreds of hundreds of, of phyla of bacteria. So no need to remember, and these are old names, they're not used anymore, we don't use these names. But uh, the point here is that um, bacteria are quite different from all the other organisms um, on the planet. Um, within the bacteria are the cyanobacteria. We talked about those before. Those are the blue-green algae. Uh, they're members of the phytoplankton community. And all the rest of the phytoplankton community is in the eukaryotes. Um, the, uh, the rest of the eukaryotes include us, we are in this um, uh, group of organisms along with all, all the other animals. Ciliates have their own um, uh, phylum um, and phylogenes as well, uh, although there's, I'm sure there's several of them. But the point here is that every um, uh, basically part of the tree of life um, is in the microbial world. And uh, the third domain um, are the archaea, or is the archaea. And, uh, we're not going to get to uh, talk much more about them, um, but perhaps one thing of note to say about them is that some of them are, are, are extreme files. They live in very extreme environments, but not all of them. Uh, many of them live just quite happily in the oceans. Um, they're thought to be uh, really important in ammonium oxidation. And also the uh, one group of them, the Uriarchiota, are the ones important in making, the only one organisms that are capable of making methane. Uh, which is, uh, of course, a uh, main ingredient of natural gas. Okay, so so that's the tree of life in all microbes. Um, so let's get back to what's happening in the oceans. And when we look at um, uh, uh, in, uh, about five milliliters of seawater that's been filtered onto a filter, this is what we see. Each one of these little dots is, that, what we're looking at here is not a, um, uh, a starry night, uh, but rather a a, uh, a, again, five milliliters of seawater that's been stained with, with a DNA-specific stain, uh, DAPI is the acronym. Um, now, that important for you to remember. Um, uh, I want you to remember that you do look at these by looking at their DNA for the most part. And so um, when uh, the epifluorescence microscope was first used, um, this is what they started to see. And they saw these huge numbers of organisms, huge numbers. In fact, there's roughly about a billion cells per liter, or a million per milliliter, um, in all the oceans. That, that varies uh, quite a bit, uh, roughly twofold or so. Um, and it's a little bit remarkable that, that we always have this number, uh, although there's, again, some variation around it. Um, why that is, why there's that number is not 100% understood. It's, we'll see in a moment why the number is roughly constant. Uh, wherever you go in the oceans and also in aquatic environments it's, it's, it's also about this number of, of cells about a billion per liter um, and so we do know that because we can just count these things and we know how much water we filtered and we just count them no, nothing more complicated than that and also you can do this by flow cytometry so they're really abundant and, and in fact they're the most abundant organism on the planet and so this is a graph um, uh, 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 put together by John Cullen and colleagues back a few years ago, um, looking at size of organisms ranging from bacteria all the way down to the macrozooplankton. Um, uh, that um, uh, and you can see here that, that the bacteria are the most abundant organisms. If we had viruses here, we're going to talk a bit more about viruses today and, and more in our next lecture. They're uh, even tenfold more abundant than the bacteria. But let's stick with living organisms for now. And, and again, bacteria are the most abundant. Also, what, since I have this graph up here, um, I'll, I'd like to say and point out that uh, growth rate also varies um, ex, uh, uh, inversely with body size. That is, these organisms are much more fast, uh, grow much more quickly than the larger organisms. Um, there's some weird things happening up here. And again, this is a log scale. It's the only way you can get all these orders of magnitude onto one graph. Um, so there's some things um, about the growth rate and size that are kind of weird up there in the, in the uh, details in the corner. But as an overall rule, um, small things grow faster than big things. 
And I think your general experience uh, about biology, uh, you know, would support that. You think about the lifespan of a sequoia or a redwood tree or uh, or an elephant, much longer than um, a, a grass or a flower or uh, or uh, um, you know, it's a, a, an insect. Um, all of those have short lifespans compared to bigger organisms. And that's the case also for the plankton. So, um, so not only are they abundant, um, but um, so you could argue, well, okay, so what? There's lots of these guys, but they're so small, they can't mount to much. Well, that's not the case. Um, and this is just some um, uh, data that comes from the Barents Sea, which is um, basically above Norway, um, part of the Arctic. Uh, ocean, and and you know, uh, you probably could have guessed that by seeing the polar bears. Um, yes, there's polar bears in the Arctic, not down in Antarctica. Although I probably could have something similar and not have uh, polar bears, but have penguins um, and uh, killer whales, I guess. Anyway, the point here is that all these charismatic megafauna, these big guys, are you know they're big, but there's so few of them that their total biomass. Um, is rather trivial compared to the bacteria, compared to the bacteria. So not only are the uh, uh, bacteria numerous, but they, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot of biomass and stuff in them. So, um, so the question then becomes, and this is what the field was wrestling with back in the 1970s, 1980s, um, just as I was starting to, uh, uh, my work, um, are these little guys actually doing anything and growing? And that became a real question because all we know is that they're there. They have DNA because we can stain for their DNA, but we don't know if they're alive from that. Um, in fact, one of the first things we do when we get a sample is kill it. And so we don't know if, if that dot there with DNA still was, was alive before we killed it. Um, in fact, there was some evidence to indicate that they were not very much alive at all. Um, the, and a piece of evidence was that if you do what's called a plate count, and if you add um, a few drops of seawater to an auger plate that is round like that and, and um, has nutrients in them, what you'll see over a few days is organisms that will grow up and form these colonies of visible macroscopic uh, you know, clumps of cells that we can count. And the idea is that one that's a cell lands on to, uh, onto that plate and then grows exponentially, as we talked about before, until it finally gets to be big enough to be seen as a colony. Um, and so, there, so that's, the, that's the idea, the plate count method. So here's, here's what those things look like. You know, again, these things have um, nutrients in, in them, organic compounds. Um, often it's like milk extract or protein um, from a cow. Um, and that's put into the auger. It's a solid media. It's made of a polysaccharide from um, uh, macro, macroalgae. Um, and, um, and so then over time, you get these organisms that grow up on, on the plate. Um, and again, one, that single colony there um, uh, arose from one cell that divided and divided and divided until it formed something that we could see. And so when you do that, you can count the number of colonies that form on these auger plates, and you can deduce that there are about a thousand cells per mil. Well, it sounds like a lot, right? Well, what was the number we saw by the direct count method? Anyone remember? It was about a billion per liter, or or ten to six cells per mil. Huge difference in, in numbers of cells between the two methods. So that that created some consternation, and you know. Microbiologists were wondering what the heck is going on with this, and one idea was, well, what, you know, because we need a cell to grow to, to make these things, the implication is that the, a lot of these guys are simply not dead, are not alive, they're dead, um, and so that changes our ideas about how things flow through the system. If in fact most of these things are dead, well, we needed some other um, ways in which we could look at this question because there are other reasons why they don't grow on. on the, on the plates. And to give away the answer, those reasons, they don't like plates for one thing, they're not used to growing on the plate, um, is, is why we see this difference. But the back up in time, at the time we didn't really know all that. And we needed other methods for looking at whether or not they're alive. And the method that, that um, many methods have been used over the years, but my favorite is what's called microautoradiography. And so the 
micro auto react it kind of gives you if you take apart the word it kind of gives you a clue about what's happening here the auto react part comes from the fact that um, you're using radioactive uh, uh, organic material and usually what's used is tritium we, um, I don't think we've talked about tritium yet but it's a very very um, uh, uh, low energy uh, radioactive version of hydrogen and so you can get various compounds like leucine uh, labeled with tritium and you feed that those bacteria the tritium uh, tritium labeled uh, DOM you filter them so you allow you let them incubate with the stuff for a while you filter them you put in uh, them into photographic film emulsion now back in the days before you know cell phones and and uh, these all these fancy electronic cameras there was something that you know there was actually film I, I'm kind of curious if anyone has actually taken a picture with a regular old camera and that film um, has com uh, um, compounds in it that are sensitive to light well radiation is basically a, f a form of light energy and so that light energy hits the film and it develops and it forms these black splotches so we filter the organisms down onto a filter we stain it with DAPI, which are DNA specific stain and then we look at the scope and sure enough what we see is these cells that are radioactive the ones with the black splotches around them have taken up the radioactive compounds and they have uh, developed a film and so now we knew that this guy over here was was alive when, when we put it into the bottle with the radioactive DOM and um, and that's why it's radioactive whereas this guy isn't um, that that guy um, has not taken up DOM or at least taken up enough DOM for it to be captured and, and seen with this this method and so the answer was there's a lot of bacteria that were in fact alive um, quite a bit of work on what the exact fraction I will ask you to remember um, exact fraction because again it, it varies and depends on who you talk to and what method you use and where you do this but suffice it to say it's not that the, the enough are alive that it does not explain why um, there's this difference between the plate counts and the direct counts um, uh, there should be much more uh, those two methods should give the same answer much more similar answer than than what they do uh, based on these results so a lot of the bacteria in fact are alive is doing something important in the environment the other implication I mean so it means that um, you know what we see under, like, underneath the microscope are in fact organisms that are involved in carrying out the processes that we're interested in um, but what it means is that if you can't grow it on a plate it means that many of the traditional methods in microbial um, ecology and, and microbiology you just can't do them you can't grow them up in the lab um, now there are other methods that have been developed um, they're much more difficult to do um, so it means that um, we have to use a, a variety of other methods for looking at questions like like this things that are kind of taken for granted for looking at larger organisms are much more difficult to do with these organisms um, but but we're um, you know making a lot of progress and um, you know that's what the field of microbial ecology or microbial oceanography is all about is to answer these questions and, and others about the role of these microbes um, in the oceans okay so um, you can guess that that these organisms are in fact quite alive and they're growing and we could do the same game as we did with for the phytoplankton and ask the question well if they're alive and growing even at a relatively slow growth rate um, at, at one per day doubling every every day in fact they probably grow more even more slowly that than that on average in the ocean but let's say they grow once per day uh, it, the same answer would occur um, that is the oceans would quickly fill up and be solid bacteria in fact we know that's not the case I mean there's a lot of bacteria in the oceans but but it's not totally solid with them and, and one of the answers and one of the reasons why it's not solid with um, with bacteria is the fact that there are organisms that have keyed in on these low rich nuggets of protein the bacteriovores on the grazers of bacteria and so um, you actually know the answer to what this the question here is who are the grazers of the bacteria so you know that we I've, I've mentioned already that they're about 0.5 microns in size so if you use a 1 to 10 rule um, you should be able to guess that they are going to be the 
uh, the protease. And I quickly skipped over some other organisms that are bigger than that. Uh, and they, you know, I don't want to, you know, minimize the importance of uh, some of the filter feeding shellfish are able to uh, uh, eat bacteria. Uh, but for the most part, um, th that's really you know, only important in marshes. We see a lot of these shellfish or in our coastal areas, shore. Uh, some of the zooplankton are able to eat bacteria, and only because the, those bacteria are on detritus. And we'll get down to that and uh, talk about that later when we talk about the positive feeders and detritivores that are eating detritus um, and also the bacteria associated with that detritus. But the main um, grazers of uh, the bacteria are these protease and flagellates. Um, so with that, we're going we're gonna to kind of segue and talk a little bit about their grazing. So um, fortunately, we don't need to uh, 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 go over everything because basically many of the things are the same. That is, the functional responses are similar to grazing. Uh, uh, that we already seen uh, for the larger zooplankton. The big difference, though, is is the feeding mechanism. It's really radically different. And we talked about how you can divide up the zooplankton by the feeding mechanism. Um, and, and phagocytosis, which we'll talk about in a minute, is the, the last method of feeding that we, we have skipped over until now. So the big difference is that mechanism, the phagocytosis. And also um, the physical environment. So when you get down to this scale, um, it's a really different world than what we see, even in, uh, even in for the uh, larger zooplankton. Not to not to mention our our own uh, scale. Um, it's a it's a low Reynolds number environment, and things are more like molasses at the micron scale than like what we are in in right now, air or even in water, uh, where things move more by turbulent mixing as opposed to diffusion. Um, so we're not going to talk more about um, this, this, how the physics differ at the micron scale. I want to talk now about how these um, uh, proteins feed. And, and, uh, and the answer is phagocytosis, as I mentioned already. And what's phagocytosis? Well, go to our favorite source of information. Um, and this is a pretty good definition. It's a cellular process of engulfing solid particles by a cell membrane. Um, uh, into and to form an internal phagosome by phagocytes. So the the, the word originally uh, was used to describe what happens with um, uh, with uh, white blood cells in our body, um, but it's it's now being used to describe uh, what happens with proteins. And so the big difference is that um, instead of this uh, what's the word that they use phagosome, um, the uh, proteins have a food vacuole that they put the, the food in. So let's look at a little diagram of what's happening here. So this is our protease, not a real pretty one, um, basically here. Um, and it's in, taken in a, a prey particle, um, uh, a, like a bacterium, uh, may or may not have a flagella, kind of trivial. Um, and also I should say that the size difference here is much uh, exaggerated. The difference in protease size versus Prey size is not as big as suggested by this diagram. Um, I made the protease bigger just to make sure I can include all these different steps uh, within the body. So anyway, the point here is that the prey is engulfed, and, and there's this membrane that's formed around the prey, um, the food vacuole. So right there, that's what that's what differs between what, what protease do versus what eat, what us do uh, and what zooplankton do. Um, so there's and if you think about our own digestive tract, which is, you know, on a very crude scale, analogous to what happens in zooplankton, basically food just passes through us and we take out nutrients as it goes through. You know, if you think about it, it's just being one single tube going from our mouth to our anus. Um, it's just passing through us. It's not, we're not engulfing it in some membrane or cell. Um, it's just passing through us. Uh, uh, again, I, you know, Hard to get too. I don't want to get too graphic, graphic about what's actually happening in our own digestive tract. Um, but basically, you, you can think about a food particle that we take in. That um, you know, yogurt you had for breakfast. At least I have yogurt and cereal for breakfast, or the hamburger you may have had for lunch. Um, never really, um, you know, it just passes through us. It, it's not as if it's inside of us in the real sense of being inside our cells. Uh, what's happening is that we're taking nutrients from the hamburger or yogurt um, and, and, and 
and breaking them down to forms that we can then take inside of ourselves. So this is really a radically, phagocytosis is a really radically different way of feeding, where you basically the cells take it inside of it and form a membrane around it, and then the hydrolytic enzymes are, are, are released inside of the, uh, the uh, food vacuole, breaking the prey down, um, and those smaller byproducts, basically less than, probably less than um, roughly 500 Daltons or so, are taken into the cell and where they're used for uh, biosynthesis of the protease um, uh, components. And there could be some release of things that are not digested by the protease. So that's the, that's the, the key thing again here is this engulfing of the prey and this formation of food vacuole. Um, that's a, a membrane encased um, uh, way of, 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 of carrying out digestion. Okay, so how do how do zoopla how do protease grazers uh, uh, respond to their prey? Again, these same type of of, of uh, terms and, and processes um, generally uh, apply to protease grazing. I mean, the only thing, of course, there's no eggs to think about, no sex stance between protease. They basically don't have sex, although there may be some exchange of genetic material. Uh, but for the most part, there's um, a very analogous type of responses. Uh, in terms of prey numbers to grazing and so on in numerical responses. Okay, so as you may guess, um, grazing isn't a total answer. Um, and that became evident, uh, well, it should have been evident much long, uh, earlier than it actually was. There was papers back in the, um, you know, you can see the dates here, 79 and 84, um, uh, finding evidence of, of, of viruses. And I once talked to uh, Francisco Torella about this, and he was kind of bitter of the fact that his paper was basically kind of ignored because the real um, uh, papers that kind of uh, brought marine viruses into the uh, even national scene um, were published, you can see there in 89, 91. Nature is a really high profile journal. So uh, so even though there are these earlier papers, um, uh, 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 it really wasn't uh, appreciated until uh, 89, 91, and ever since then we've been talking about viruses. And I think one reason why um, the, the Torella and Morita paper was not uh, appreciated because it was done uh, with electron microscopy, and they really didn't get really high um, abundance numbers with that method back then. Um, so I, I don't think people appreciate how, um, how abundant they were um, at that time. Anyway, so what are viruses? Um, uh, hopefully you know already a bit about viruses. Um, basically they're genetic material surrounded by protein. Um, and notice that it's not just DNA. And of course, every other biological entity, all organisms have DNA as their genetic material. Um, but that's not the case with viruses. Um, uh, 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 they, they can have RNA and different types of RNA. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're small. You can see the size there. There's some big viruses, maybe half a microns in size, but for the most part, they're small. Um, and what's really crucial is that they, they don't live by themselves. They don't have any metabolism outside of the host. So this is a big reason why I don't um, consider, and many other people don't consider viruses to be alive. Um, there's some, you know, you can get a little bit philosophical about this. Um, you know, we could say, well, that even small children are not um, are not independent, totally independent, and function by themselves. Um, but the fact that you need to infect a host, um, you don't, and you don't have anything, you're not doing anything if you don't, if you're not inside of a host. Uh, I think really sep separates them from all the other organisms on, in the biosphere. Anyway, um, so just some pictures of them. So here's here's my favorite. Um, uh, bacteriophage. So back up, when we talk about phage or bacteriophages, those are just viruses of bacteria. So viruses are a more general term. Phage is a more specific term to talk just about viruses of bacteria. So here's my favorite, uh, 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 the T4 virus, very distinctive um, landing gear type of uh, 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 structure to it. The DNA, this is a really complicated structure. Uh, many of them are not very complicated at all. Um, here's the tobacco mosaic virus, um, really well studied because <laughs> I think the uh, 
tobacco industry has supported a lot of work on, on various things about the tobacco plant, including its viruses. Here's again the PT4 virus. Um, here's the HIV virus. Um, uh, you can see a much different shape to it. And one thing that makes HIV uh, so hard to uh, uh, defend against and, and to cure is the fact that it takes on a membrane from its uh, host, us. Um, and that makes it difficult for the immune system to uh, recognize it being a bad thing. And it also gives a hint here that the HIV is an example of a virus with um, virus, um, with RNA, um, as opposed to DNA as genetic material. Um, here's the Ebola virus, once again in the news, uh, well, not so much in the news right now. Um, and then here's the last slide for today. Um, and this is just to um, uh, uh, emphasize the fact that there's many different types of genetic material that's used by, by viruses. Um, so um, most of the bacteria, most of the bacteria use have um, double-stranded, their viruses that hit bacteria have double-stranded DNA. Um, and of course, that's what we have, what eukaryotes have, what bacteria and archaea have, double-stranded DNA for their genetic material. But you can see that viruses have all these different other forms of genetic material. Um, and basically every other form of, of genetic material you can think of, RNA, DNA, and so on, double-stranded, single-stranded, um, different whether it's the, the RNA goes in as a coding region or whether it has to be um, the uh, 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 coding region, or it's not the coding region, it has to be, the complement has to be made to before it's made into proteins. So basically all different varieties of, of genetic material. So, the, and, the, and the size of these, or, uh, I was about to say organisms, but uh, they're not organisms, they're, they're biological entities, these viruses, they vary quite a bit too. And they vary quite a bit because the genome size varies. The genome size varies to from just, you know, you, know, you can see there are 39,000 base pairs all the way up to much bigger than that, almost up to big, uh, bacterial size. Now, put that in perspective, um, uh, uh, you know, a typical uh, uh, protein may have maybe a thousand bases or so. So some of these are only a few genes uh, in size. Um, they only have enough genetic material to, uh, uh, to, uh, to infect a cell and take over that cell. So again, that's how they make a living. They, they have just enough genetic material to take over that cell and to make more virus particles. That's their whole mission in life. 